Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, we're looking at 9.01 a.m. now, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we've got a few people, this looks like still trickling in, but um, We'll go ahead and get started with our program this morning. Um, so good morning. If you are have not met me yet, my name is Ashley Wong. I'm an attorney here at Equinox Business Law. Um, and today we're going to be talking about bringing workers back on site in the wake of COVID-19, um, you know, recognizing that the state of Washington has started to implement a phased reopening process. And so what does that look like? How do we bring our workers back um, in a way that is safe and protects the company? Um, from any possible liability, what kinds of things do we need to be thinking about? So we're going to go ahead and uh, just get into our program here. Um, this is intended to be a Q&A webinar. The attendees are muted right now, so you're not going to be able to speak out to ask a question, but you can type your question into the Q&A box as you have them, and we will respond to them um, as we as we have time to. Um, and then we'll also leave some time at the end for uh, answering any questions. If you have a question that is, you know, very specific to your company, we might not address it during this webinar, but we will follow up with you afterwards um, to to uh, address any specific questions like that. But we'll we'll do our best to, to answer any questions um, today um, as best we can. Just as a quick disclaimer, this presentation is not intended to be legal advice. It's not going to address anyone's specific circumstances. So we always recommend, um, you know, talking to an, an attorney uh, before you take any action or refrain from taking any action. Okay, so um, this is going to feel probably like a gross simplification of the process to bring employees back on site, but I'm going to break it down into a few steps five steps to be exact. Um, so the first step here that we're going to talk about, we're going to go, go through each of these and, and what kind of things we need to be thinking about, um, is to gather a team of people um, who will be responsible for managing the effort of bringing workers back on site. The second step is to understand what rules apply to your company specifically. And the third step is to classify the stakeholders, all of the different people that are involved, including employees, clients, etc. And then finally, um, identifying appropriate safeguards, which is really going to be probably where you'll spend the bulk of your time and then communicating out all of the um, policies and procedures and protocols that you've decided to take um, as you do bring workers back on site. Of course, this is a very rapidly changing situation. We're seeing updated guidance um, happening, you know, every day from the various different authorities here. So we want to be prepared, mentally prepare ourselves to adapt quickly and to make changes as we see fit. So we're going to keep in contact and keep those communications happening early and often. A few notes before we really get started here. Um, you know, I do want to note that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, our governor has used the metaphor of turning a dial rather than flipping a switch. So, you know, the idea here is not to just bring everybody back and get everything back to normal immediately. It's going to be, um, you know, a, a process that we're going to go through and uh, we're going to think through it thoughtfully um, and, and take steps, um, you know, in order, to, of course, to ensure the safety of our workers and our customers. Um, the second thing that I want to just uh, the second point that I want to make here is that legal requirements are somewhat subjective. So you know there is going to be a lot of room for interpretation and um, decisions that you're going to need to make around you know for instance what kind of safeguards that you feel it's necessary to implement in order to keep your workers safe. Employees may also feel differently. Employees may feel that they want additional protections, and so we're going to have to, to wrestle with those things. Um, so it may be wise to err on the side of taking more measures than might be um, necessarily legally required in order to help your workers and your clients and your customers feel um, safe coming um, on site. And for the time being, um, you know, it's important to note that the governor's office is recommending that employers be flexible with allowing employees to work from home wherever possible. So um, for, for many employees, this will be the preferred course of action. I know that, um, you know, there are a, a group of us who are probably getting a little stir crazy and are excited to get back into the office and to see our coworkers again. But there's also going to be those employees who, for a variety of reasons, are not ready to come back into the office. Um, and so those, you know, those the governor is encouraging flexibility. And, and, and all of all of the authority figures really are encouraging flexibility and allowing for continued work from home. Hey, Ashley, um, there is a little bit of um, feedback um, on your audio. Sometimes it goes in and out. Um, just wanted to let you know, uh, just in case okay. you want to um, uh, uh, switch rooms or um, if you have a hotspot available. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Hillary. I will um, do my best to speak up and um, hopefully my internet connection will, uh, will, will hold out for us. Okay, so the first step that we're going to take here is gathering a team. Okay, yeah, I am seeing um, that, um, sorry, I'm just, I'm looking at the chat here and I'm seeing that folks are having a hard no, time hearing that. me. So I'm gonna do my best to get my internet connection cooperating. Okay, so the first step that we're gonna take here is we're gonna try and gather a team. Um, of people, so we're not going to try, we're going to do it. We're going to gather a team of people um, who will be responsible for, um, for the effort of bringing employees back on site. If I can get my slide to the right slide. Um, so this is going to be a team of leadership and stakeholders who, um, you know, who are going to be really, you know, hands on the ground with managing the situation. So who should be involved with leading that effort and managing? And this is just an example of, uh, of some of the folks that you might want to include on that team, um, or a lot of folks are calling them the coronavirus task force. Um, so that might include executives um, and officers, management, human resources, of course, um, as they're going to be, you know, deeply involved with communicating with employees and hearing employees' concerns and dealing with other, um, other situations like employee leave um, that might also be related here. Facilities and office management, of course, we're going to have a lot of cleaning and disinfecting and, and other uh, steps that we're going to take specifically with regard to the, you know, the, the facilities and the, the cleanliness and the safety of the workspace. So facilities and office management will be instrumental there. Legal, um, whether that be outside or inside legal. You might have um, some folks who are managing supplier and outside contractor relationships, and those folks um, will potentially be instrumental in communicating expectations with clients and suppliers and, and all of your other business partners. Um, marketing, so if you do have sort of a customer-facing, uh, public-facing business, like a, a retail shop, then you'll, you might want some marketing, uh, a marketing person or two on this team, um, you know, to talk about things like updates that you need to make to the website, email communications that need to be sent out to customers, and then, of course, any professional advisors or consultants that you've hired um, to assist with this effort. Okay, next up is understanding the rules. Now, this is gonna be just a long list of authorities here because um, you know the rules that are gonna to apply to your business are gonna be particular to your business. Of course, there are some rules that are going to apply to everybody. So for instance, the World Health Organization and the, C and the CDC have been providing you know, uh, guidance that apply you know, really to all companies. Um, so this, the World Health Organization is going to be particularly relevant for companies with an international footprint. Um, and the CDC has been really helpful in providing guidance based on scientific updates and what were, you know, the, the additional learnings that we've had throughout this whole of course, OSHA specifically addresses employer requirements for safety in the workplace, and they've pro uh, provided some guidance on what it looks like to prepare your workplace for COVID-19 and having your workers on site. Um, that's been the case for both essential workers that have been working throughout this whole, um, this last two months. Um, and then it's also going to be true for workers who are coming back, um, who, are have, who are not necessarily essential workers, but who are coming back on site as we continue to phase in um, go through the governor's phase process. The EEOC is the authority that enforces the ADA, and they've provided guidance around pandemic response for people with disabilities specifically. The Washington Governor's Office, um, they've of course been leading the charge here in Washington with the phase reopening plan, and they're continuing to um, you know, keep us updated on, on where we're at in that phased plan, as well as providing industry-specific guidance um, where, where necessary and where they, you know, as, as, as it's, it's, you know, there have been new ones coming out every day, so um, we keep an eye on that if we are in one of those industries where we need, do need that very specific guidance. The Washington Department of Health is tracking the status of cases in Washington um, and providing guidance for screening. You can also find posters um, for your businesses to put up, both from the CDC, from the Department of Health, from OSHA. You can find sort of these free resources um, from a lot of these uh, different agencies as well. 
Um, okay, so we've talked through um, the Washington Governor's Office, the Department of Health, and then, you know, I, di I did want to make a point to note that there is industry-specific guidance that has been provided by a number of different offices, including the Governor's Office, who has provided construction, um, vehicle sales, car wash, landscape services, pet walking, and other, you know, dine-in restaurants and other industry-specific guidance. Um, we've also seen guidance from King County around restaurants, property management, food delivery. Um, the Department of Health has provided information on uh, also food services, child care facilities, um, and OSHA also has some industry-specific guidance as well, particularly related to safety measures to take. Um, in order to protect your workers. Um, so to the extent that those, uh, that you're in any of those industries that have been provided with industry specific guidance, um, I of course would recommend um, checking those out and making sure that you are doing um, what you can to comply um, and, and take the steps that are being recommended. Um, and of course, we also have um, county and, and city and local municipal um, authorities who are uh, making recommendations and pro providing guidance. So for instance, King County or Pierce County, um, landlords and property management. I just, these are, these are some, you know, what would be specific to your business um, is that you might be leasing a space. And so your landlord and your property management companies um, might have some guidance for commons, for use of common spaces like elevators and um, lunch spaces. Um, I do see a question here that if there are differences in the guidance provided by different agencies, who do we go with? It's a really great question, and I would say um, almost always to go with the more protective or more restrictive measure. So if you do see a recommendation, of, um, you know, if, you, if you're running a restaurant and you see a recommendation from uh, OSHA that says that, you know, maybe you don't need to provide masks to your employees, I don't I don't think it says that. Um, but, and then King County that says that you do need to provide masks, I would err on the side of providing masks. Um, so to the extent that, that they conflict or, or, or differ, go with a more protective or restrictive measure. Um, and then, of course, you may also have contracts that, um, that govern, you know, with your business partners and your clients that impose some level of obligation as well. So to the extent that you um, have those relationships that you want to, you know, maintain and um, that you have actually legal obligations, um, then you're going to want to talk with those folks um, to make sure that you are doing everything you can to, um, to maintain those relationships and meet your contractual obligations. Okay, so this is a, a graphic that you're probably familiar with. This is Washington's phased approach. This is really just here, um, you know, as an illustrative purpose um, that we're, we're working through these phases and this is going to guide our decision making as we work our way through this whole you know, whatever, the next uh, three months, six months, one year, however long this takes um, to get us back to, um, you know, as close to what, what normal was before. Um, so we're going to use this um, as sort of our, our framework for when it's appropriate for our business to bring workers back on site. And I will also note that the governor's office has said that even if you are um, in one of the industries that is permitted to reopen, um, that business activities are not authorized to open until your business is able to meet all of the safety criteria that they've provided. Okay, so classifying our stakeholders. So this is, um, the idea behind this is we're going to look at all of the people who are potentially affected by our businesses reopening or bringing workers back on site so that we can, can look at what communications do we need to send out, what types of safety measures. So this is going to be um, sort of gui uh, building a framework and guiding our efforts from here on out. So some of our stakeholders that you might have in your business, this is of course going to be specific to your business, but you likely have employees. You're going to have different categories of employees um, who you may need to communicate with in different ways. So, and, and that you may actually need to make varying policies based on some of those um, factors of, of, of what's going on in, for, you know, for the employee's duties or, or in their lives. So 
you might have management. Your management is going to, um, you know, be the ones who are communicating with uh, their direct reports um, and setting expectations as far as um, when they're supposed to be in the office or, you know, continuing the, the work from home communications. You might have workers in high risk categories. Um, this is, uh, you know, I, I'll just hit, make a quick note here that we have, you know, there may be a, a, a sort of gut reaction um, but to not bring workers who are in high risk categories. So workers who are older, uh, you know, in, in the, I think above the age of, you know, 55 or 65, whatever the, the, the at risk age is. Um, workers who are pregnant, workers who have underlying conditions, there might be a gut instinct to say, you don't come back on site. Um, I think we want to, to uh, work against that instinct because that could open us up to potential claims of discrimination um, that we are taking an employment action based on a member, uh, on an individual's membership in a protected class. So we don't want to say, you know, if you're over 60, don't come into the office. Um, you know, I think we want to leave the, the choice up to them and um, also take whatever measures that we can to help them feel comfortable coming back into the office. Other things that you might need to consider for employees are the duties and the nature of your operations. So you might have employees who are perfectly fine doing their work from home um, and working remotely and it's been working great thus far and we've all kind of settled in. Um, and so those folks can continue working from home, um, but you may have folks who are not able to do that or whose jobs are much more difficult when they're working remotely. So you do want to bring them back. So those are considerations. You will also have employees who have very practical challenges like childcare needs, given that the schools are not open. And um, you know, maybe, maybe um, their daycare is not open yet, or maybe you just don't feel comfortable sending your children to daycare. You may also have transportation challenges for uh, employees who rely on public transportation or who have historically commuted into work with other folks, um, and that's not possible anymore. You might have different departments. So for instance, if you, you may have an office space and a warehouse space. Of course, warehouse workers are not able to do their jobs from home, so that might impact your decisions as well. You will also, um, you know, many of us have unfortunately had to lay off or furlough or put employees on standby. So those employees, you're gonna have to um, take a look at um, whether you need to rehire them or how best to bring them back and how to decide who we're bringing back. Some other stakeholders that you might have, you may have independent contractors. Uh, for our independent contractors, um, we do just want to be aware that uh, we can't exercise the same level of control over them as we do our employees, so we just want to be aware of that. Um, we'll also have clients and customers. If you have multiple business locations, for instance, um, then you may have different expectations for clients who are coming to each different location, different instructions to provide them in order um, for them to come on site um, for, uh, you know, to, to, to participate in your services. Um, you may have critical activities that need to be done in person, and you may have different categories of clients or customers as far as their risk tolerance. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then you might have business partners, and then you'll want to take a look at, um, at, at who else that you might have specific to your business um, that might be impacted by your operations, um, either continuing um, or bringing workers back on site. So I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into that. So we're going to look at, as, we, as we're looking at the stakeholders who are involved here, we're going to consider all aspects of our operations and the impact that each of them has um, on, on the groups that we've identified. I've already talked through some of these here. Um, uh, so we've kind of walked through the different levels, uh, the different employees. I do want to also note here that you might just simply have different comfort levels for employees. Employees might also have personal situations. For instance, they might have a family member at home who has an underlying condition, or they may have elderly parents that they're living with, and they are concerned about, uh, you know, going out into public and then bringing something back um, and putting their loved ones at risk. So you may also just have employees who just simply don't feel comfortable coming into work, um, and so that's something that we're going to have to wrestle with. Some of the um, considerations that we're going to look at specifically with respect to employees um, is 
how are we going to decide who we're bringing back, when, where, all of those types of things. Um, so the first question here is, um, you know, who, really who is eligible to come back on site? And so as you are, are laying out your different categories of employees here, you're going to identify who do I want to bring back on site? Who am I ready to bring back on site? Um, as you uh, are bringing them back on site, in what manner are you going to do that? Are you going to apply a phased approach? Maybe your office is small enough that you can just bring, you know, for instance, our office, we only, you know, have a handful of us and we uh, have our own office spaces. So we're able to distance ourselves enough that we could probably all come back all at once. Um, but to the extent that you have more employees, and you may, uh, you may not be able to do that. You may need to apply a phase approach or you may need to implement some type of alternating shifts or alternating days of the week in which employees come into work. If you're looking at doing phases, you might need to consider how many employees will, can, will, will return to work in each phase and how those phases are defined. So you might wanna look, um, you, know, you, you might base this off of the governor's phase approach or you may have um, you know, your own unique decision-making and factors that play into how you determine what your phases are. How much flexibility and freedom do your employees have in coming back to work? Um, you know, do they have the ability to say, you know, I don't feel comfortable, so I'm gonna work from home, is that okay? Um, if it's not, then we're gonna have to consider what happens if an employee refuses to come, to come back to work, and I will touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. Do you have facilities limitations um, that you need to, uh, to work through in order to accommodate social distancing? We're going to talk a little bit more about that during the, uh, you know, once, once we address the safeguards that we're going to take um, as we pre prepare to bring workers back in. And then laid off, furloughed, standby employees. Um, there are going to be a number of considerations here. So for instance, if you've had to lay off employees, then you're going to have to rehire them. Um, they may not need to go through your entire regular hiring process. So they may not to go, may not need to go through, um, you know, you may, for instance, choose to waive a drug testing requirement, or you may choose to, um, you know, not make them go through an interview process. You may not need to check their references. There will, however, be some activities that you need to do in order to bring them back on. For instance, if they had an employment agreement in place before they were um, laid off, then you would need to re-sign that employment agreement. If you have confidentiality, invention assignment agreements, NDAs, they're going to need to re-sign those as well. If you have an employee handbook acknowledgement, then you're going to need them to re-sign that. And then, of course, you're going to have to go through the regular legal hiring process of having them complete their I-9s and W-4s. Um, you may also, if, uh, with respect to employee pay, need to have them re-sign direct deposit forms and other things like that. So just sort of the, the, the technical um, process of, of hiring your employees, you'll have, to, you'll have to go through some of those efforts again. Um, there is also a requirement to reinstate paid sick leave where it's required. So in the state of Washington, if, uh, if an employee is terminated um, and then rehired within a certain amount of time, then you do need to reinstate any paid sick leave that they had accrued previously but hadn't used. If you have employees who have been furloughed or put on standby or, um, or on shared work or otherwise reduced their hours, then you're going to need to communicate the changes to the operations and the effective dates of those changes. So for those employees who are um, claiming unemployment right now, they're going to need to know the effective date of, of when they're returning back to full time um, so that they can um, submit their unemployment claims accurately. And then benefits. Benefits are, uh, are are tricky. I think a lot of folks have uh, have had to um, you know work closely with their plan providers around um, who gets to maintain their benefits and who is losing their benefits because they're not meeting the minimum hours requirements. Um, so you're going to want to talk to your plan provider regarding reinstatement of any benefits um, for employees who were not able to keep them. And then. Based on your policies, you may have an employee handbook, for instance, that provides for other types of leave. Um, so you're also going to want to make sure that you've considered um, and if there are any impacts to other leave that you provide, like PTO or vacation time, and how that plays into all of this um, with employees wanting to, um, to take leave. All right. 
independent contractors, I've already noted that um, there are limitations on how much we can control and how much how much control that we want to exercise over our contractors um, because they are not employees. So especially if you have a contractor who is a sole proprietor, um, then we're going to want to be careful there. So we can, of course, make recommendations and set expectations, but um, you may not be able to, to uh, provide as much control as you do over your employees. Um, and of course, you're going to want to communicate project planning and prioritization um, and how the return to work efforts are going to impact those projects. So for our clients and customers and business partners, they're all going to, um, you know, this, this is going to be highly situation specific and we're going to need to deal with these on a case by case basis. So for instance, you may have clients or customers who want to come on site or who need to come on site in order to engage in critical activities that um, either must be done in person or that they prefer to do in person. Um, so for instance, if you need to, you know, film a video um, and while you may be able to do it via Zoom, it's much more, you know, it's, 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 it's better to do in a production environment, um, then that's something that, that you will need to consider. You may alternatively have clients who do not want to come on site. And so we're going to have to look at those um, and, and figure out how we're going to, what, what's our position going to be and how are we going to communicate those decisions. You may have others, so just some examples, for instance, you may have a janitorial staff um, and or, or you may have a, a, a a janitor through your through your your lease in your building, um, and so are you going to have additional requirements and expectations for that service? Um, IT services. If you have had workers from working remotely and then are bringing them back on site, you may need to communicate with your IT services professionals um, to make sure that all of your technical infrastructure is ready for folks to come back. Okay, so we're going to get into the meat of the conversation here. This is where a bulk of your efforts are going to be spent is identifying appropriate safeguards. So first, what are our requirements? That's going to be the biggest, the important piece here is what am I required to do? OSHA has a general duty for employers that you must provide employees with a workplace that's free from hazards um, that are likely to cause death or serious physical harm. Of course, um, you know, we, we recognize the danger that COVID-19 presents to our workforce, um, and so we're going to do everything that we can in order to keep our workers safe. OSHA has separated different employees into um, varying levels of risk, ranging from low, you know, so the, you know, I would be considered low risk. I, you know, I'm, I'm not interacting with um, other people on a regular basis. I'm working remotely, so I would be considered low risk. So um, there's very little that we need to do in order to maintain my safety. On the other hand, an, empl uh, an employee at a hospital who is regularly interacting with COVID-19 patients would be considered a very high risk. So you're going to want to look at the OSHA guidance on where your business might fit there and to the extent that people are impact uh, are, are uh, communicating and interacting with um, other people um, on a more regular basis then your risk might go from low to medium for instance so you're going to want to take a look at what the requirements are um, for your workers uh, based on their risk level there are reporting requirements um, for OSHA if COVID, in, in very sort of limited circumstances. There are requirements uh, before, before COVID-19 becomes a, rep a reportable illness. Um, so it's a recordable illness if you have a confirmed case of COVID-19, if it's work-related, which is a little bit more of a, of a challenging uh, involved question, and if it meets the general recording criteria. So for instance, the employee would have had to miss a day of work or, or you know, in, in incurred a serious injury. Um, so if it's a regularly recordable um, illness um, and it's work-related. In order for, for it to be work-related, um, then it you know, really needs to be um, more likely that the employee contracted it at work, um, you know, based on evidence. So there was a specific um, opportunity or instance where the employee was likely to have contracted it or they weren't otherwise, uh, you know, equally likely to have gotten it anywhere else. Um, so that can be a more difficult question just based on the circumstances. You are restricted from retaliating against your employees um, for raising concerns about safety in the workplace. So if an employee does raise concerns about safety, um, then you're going to want to address those concerns and you can't take any negative employment action. So we can't fire them for, you know, being concerned about safety. 
Um, can an employee refuse to come to work? Um, this is a question that we've gotten a lot and there are a couple of different levels to this question, but I just wanted to address it specifically uh, with respect to the safety element here and, and the OSHA requirements. So an employee can refuse to come back to work in a very limited circumstance and all of the following factors need to be true. So first, um, where it, the, the employee needs to have asked the employer to eliminate the danger. So they need to have notified you that the danger exists um, and you need to have failed to address it. The employee has to genuinely believe that there's an imminent danger. So of course there's a level of subjectivity there, but um, you know, as a, a reasonable person um, would agree that there's a real danger there that's subjective a little bit, so we're going to have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's sorry, very limited circumstances here. Uh, you know, I would say that an employee who's regularly interacting with the public, who's not provided a mask, that is, you know, probably a, a valid complaint that you would need to address. But um, to the extent that the employee's complaint is um, is is not, not quite so obvious, then, then it's going to be a more difficult case-by-case um, -case adjustment. Um, and then, of course, there needs to be um, you know, not enough time for the hazard to get corrected. Um, so if you, you know, the employee has a shift starting in five minutes and you don't have time to get them a mask, then yes, they may, they, maybe they uh, have a reason to not come to work. So you can see I've got the link there to the employer guidance. We will also send out these slides and um, we've got some resources, a list of resources at the end of the presentation. Okay, here we go. So safeguards. This is gonna be a non-exhaustive, non-comprehensive list of just some examples of safeguards. And I'm gonna give some examples of, of some of the things that I've been hearing from uh, clients and employers uh, regarding the steps that they're taking to implement safeguards. Um, we also did do a program at the end of last month, which you can find on our YouTube channel called Safety Practices for Essential Workers, where we had Craig Hall, who's a risk manager from BBSI, and he's worked with a number of different clients um, around this exact issue of, uh, you know, what does OSHA say um, is required for that specific business? Um, I know he's worked with folks in the manufacturing space and other industries, um, so he provided some really great helpful advice. Um, so you can go to our YouTube channel to see that program if, uh, if you're more interested in, in getting in-depth here into different safeguards that might, um, that might be relevant for your business. So some of the examples here are going to be, of course, PPE. We're hearing about this a lot. So masks, gloves, face shields, gowns, um, of course, you know, going to depend on the types of duties that the employee is, is, is working. Facilities and cleaning protocols. So, of course, we're going to be regularly disinfecting services um, and doing everything that we can to make sure that high touch, uh, frequently touched surfaces are, are being uh, disinfected. Um, I was at the grocery store the other day and they were disinfecting the entire belt um, where you put your groceries down. Um, so just one, one example of, uh, of, you know, strong disinfecting protocols. Spatial planning, room capacity. So we're going to need to look at our office space and determine, you know, for many folks have open office spaces and determine is there a way that we can accommodate social distancing, six feet of distance in between, in between people. We may need to look at room capacities. We may need to reduce the capacity of, you know, maybe a room that used to fit six people now only fits three. Um, you might have gathering restrictions. So you might tell people, you know, no more gathering in the lunch space for communal lunches. And you may need to do things like remove chairs from, office it, from, from, from offices or from communal spaces in order to encourage people to keep distance. You may need to rearrange furniture. Of course, we've seen folks installing plexiglass partitions where you're not able to keep six feet of distance. Um, marking the floor for social distancing. I've even recommended um, marking for traffic flow, and I've heard some folks have uh, ha have been doing that. So you indicate, you know, you may maybe been to the grocery store and seen um, that they, they've got one-way aisles, and so that may be something that makes sense for your office space. Um, so there's a number of different things that we can do here to make the space work for us. Another thing that we might want to do is declutter our surfaces for easier disinfecting. So you know, if, if you have a whole bunch of uh, you know knickknacks on your desk and it's going to be uh, more difficult to keep things disinfected, so we might want to do some cleanup there. 
um, communal spaces. So, uh, you know, if you have a, a, an office um, kitchen, then you may want to restrict the use of the office kitchen. So things like putting food in the fridge, um, you know, even using the microwave where everyone's touching the same button over and over, using um, office silverware. So we might want to take a look at, you know, everyone having their own sets of silverware or having disposable options. Um, reducing the use of uh, commonly used equipment like phones um, and other supplies and equipment that would be used by multiple people. Screening. So this is a little bit um, a little bit more of a trickier one. The Department of Health has provided guidance on screening, and there's a, a guidance document. It's a very simple document that just has two questions on it that um, is recommending requiring screening for employees and customers and anyone else who's coming on site, um, which essentially says, have you had any of these symptoms uh, and, and, the, and the like, those sorts of questions. Um, you may also um, have a required sign-in sheet. So anyone who comes into the office then signs in so that you can track who is in the office on any given day. If an employee then tests positive, then you have the ability to contact the people who were in the office and potentially exposed in order to isolate um, those folks so that they can, you know, be self-screening and making sure that, um, that they're not then further spreading it. Temperature taking. This is a big one. The EEOC has issued guidance indicating that employers have the right to take employees' temperatures without violating the ADA. The CDC has also provided some guidance on how to implement this. So some of the questions that they've looked at uh, or that they've answered um, or, or that you're going to need to answer if you do decide to take employee temperatures is who will be screened, who will do the screening, what kind of safety measures do you need to put in place in order for the temperature taking to be safe um, and to not potentially cross-contaminate, what kinds of training do you need to provide, where will you conduct it. Uh, so some of the recommendations here are to provide no-touch thermometers, um, train the folks who will be doing uh, the temperature taking, whether that be the employees themselves uh, or, or, you know, a designated individual. You're going to need to, of course, maintain privacy and confidentiality of any records that you decide to keep and um, any health information should be stored separately um, and securely from the regular personnel records. Um, you're also going to need to wrestle with some questions around what to do if an employee refuses to take their temperature. You can refuse to let them into work if they refuse to take their temperature. Um, and then what will you do if they show that they do have a fever? And I, I believe that the uh, CDC recommendation here is around 100.4 degrees. So if they're measuring over that, then what will you do if the employee does test, uh, does, does prove to have a fever? Um, and of course, the recommendation would be to send them home. But then we've got to deal with, um, you know, if they're working a shift, is there someone to to replace them, or, you know, or how, how do we how do we handle that? And then one of the other issues here is um, if a non-exempt employee or an hourly employee needs to get their temperature taken, we highly recommend paying them for that time. Um, if they're not able to clock in, for instance, then find an average time for how long it likely takes to um, to get their temperature taken. Now, you may need to, you know, if there's a long line of employees, um, then it may take longer. They may need to be waiting in line longer, and that's time that they, um, you know, are not are are you know, essentially working, uh, that they're required to be on site there in order to get their temperature taken. So we do recommend paying them for that time. And then you may have operation specific procedures here that you need to consider. So, you know, in, in the example of you need to film a video, then you may need to, you know, for instance, have the videographer set up the camera in advance and then have, you know, other folks go into the production space and, you know, so the making sure that we're minimizing contact as much as possible. So to the extent that you have operation specific procedures here, um, then you're going to want to instruct and, and, and think through those things and communicate the expectations. So on the topic of communicating, Um, so we've identified the stakeholders already. So we've identified all of the different people who might be impacted here. So all the different categories of employees and management, contractors, clients, customers. And now we're going to think through, now that we've decided what types of safeguards to implement, we're going to think through how do we communicate what we've been doing and what the expectations are. So we're going to communicate with all of those previously identified stakeholders, and we might need to do so in different ways. So we might create formal policies. We might send out email communications. We might require certifications and acknowledgments. So for instance, um, if you have a 
a customer who's going to come on site, you might send them an email before their appointment to say, um, you know, you agree by coming uh, to our workspace that um, that you have not had any of these symptoms, you know, and, and then so you might have sort of a, a certification or an acknowledgement here of the screening process. You may need to provide training to employees, um, so that is a level of communication. Of course, posting signage around the office um, or around your, uh, your workspace, your, your, your site. Um, and then you might need to provide some website updates um, to the extent that you have public-facing um, communications that need to get out. And we're uh, going to communicate not only the expectations for whoever's for the reader, but we're also going to communicate all the different actions that we are keep taking to keep our employees and our clients and our customers safe. And that really will uh, go a long way to, you know, helping your employees to feel more comfortable coming back to work. So if you do have employees who have concerns, communicating to them all of the different steps and measures that you're taking to keep them safe might help to alleviate some of those concerns. Okay, and some of the pitfalls here, I just wanted to address some of the things that we're seeing and hearing a lot about from clients. So the first one here is employee leave. <clears throat> Employees may be entitled to leave for a number of reasons um, over this whole crisis, um, and it might not be related to COVID-19, it might be related to something entirely separate, but we do have, for instance, the first Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, when we did the webinar back in March, I provided a little bit of, a, of an outline of what the Families First Coronavirus Response Act requires as far as coronavirus-related sick leave or leave related to closure of, of, of children's schools and things like that. Um, so employees might be entitled to leave if they've not already exhausted the leave under the FFCRA. You may have sick and safe leave that applies, um, you know, for the state of Washington or for the city of Seattle, for instance, um, or other, other leave that you've provided for in your handbooks and your employee policies. So if you provide for vacation or PTO time, then your policies are going to be what govern that. And then finally, you're gonna, you may have ADA accommodation that you need to consider. So any employees who have a qualified ADA disability, you may need to take um, those, those steps to accommodate those disabilities in order to allow the uh, employee to perform their duties. Also speaking on ADA compliance, you may have employees with disabilities that may require some level of accommodation, and that accommodation may not be necessarily leave, but it might be allowing them to continue to re work remotely, providing them with flex scheduling or providing them with unique equipment or PPE in order to um, you know, help them to do their work. We have been getting a lot of questions about impact on PPP loans, um, so of course, um, you know, we've, we've seen some folks who, um, as business is going on as usual, you might have folks who um, are, that you would like to terminate for performance issues, for instance, or folks who are going out on maternity leave um, because they've had a baby. So how do those things impact PPP loans? Because the PPP loans do require that you um, maintain your payroll levels and, um, and, and you know, maintain your number of FTEs um, that existed previously. So, um, you know, I'm not a tax professional, so here I'm going to direct you to um, talk to your tax professional, your CPA, for specific advice on how these events might impact your company specifically. Um, so, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I had recommended to um, at least one client is if you have an employee who is, for instance, out on Washington paid family medical leave, um, that you are, do have the option to top off their payments um, because they would not be receiving 100% of their pay. So you do have the option to um, provide a supplemental benefit to true up their, uh, th those benefits, what they are being paid to meet their, their regular wage. Uh, so that's just one option if you do need to maintain, but uh, I would recommend Recommend, of course, talking to a tax professional just around how this might impact um, forgiveness under PPP loans. Privacy violations. Um, so, of course, you know, to the extent that you're collecting health information, if you have employees who are testing positive and who are sharing those results with you, um, then those things need to be remaining confidential, of course, especially if you're, if you're taking temperatures. So um, we're going to treat these like, uh, like we would any other health information that we've collected for, you know, for instance, drug tests um, in the past or, um, or you know, injury-related information. We're going to um, keep it confidential. We're going to train our personnel 
personnel around how to handle um, employee health information and we store it separately from regular personnel files. So we want to make sure just to avoid any, any privacy violations there. And then finally, one of the, I just wanted to preempt one of our frequently asked questions here. I've already addressed it a little bit um, in the sense of OSHA concerns, but I also wanted to address the question um, on a higher level of can an employee refuse to come to work? So if you say, you know, we're going to reopen the office, we're going to have folks coming back in again, and I expect you to be at work on this day. Um, can an employee say, no, I'm not coming back in? So there are some circumstances where an employee may be entitled to not come to work. In addition to the OSHA safety concern that we've already outlined, um, there may be some, for instance, leave, um, employee leave that, that applies here. So if the employee is entitled to leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, under um, you know, sick and safe leave, um, paid family and medical leave, um, if any of those apply, then the employee might be entitled to be out on leave. If uh, leave is an appropriate ADA accommodation or if remote work is an appropriate ADA accommodation, um, then, then that's a circumstance where they might be entitled to not come to work. But if leave, ADA accommodations, or OSHA safety concerns do not apply, then you are free to require them to come to work. And if they refuse to come to work, you can discipline them. Now, of course, um, you know, the, all the various authorities are encouraging remote work where possible and encouraging flexibility where possible. Um, so, you know, if you are able to have some of that flexibility, then, um, then you know, that, that may be what's um, sort of the best move for, for your company um, and for that employee um, if you really don't, you know, if you don't want to terminate them. But um, you do have the right to take disciplinary action against employee who does uh, who refuses to come to work. Um, you can also address this on a case-by-case -case basis. So if an employee um, you know, has real anxiety or if they have a family member that they're concerned about um, keeping safe, um, then in those circumstances, then you may want to provide a little bit more flexibility. So that's all I have for you guys today. I do have a list of resources here, which we, you know, you can take a look at this um, when we send out the slides. And we also have a COVID-19 resources page up on our website. So you can see it on that carousel on the top of our website there. Um, but we are taking questions. So if you guys have any questions, uh, we do have about 10 minutes still to address questions. So feel free to type those into the Q&A. We'll give a couple minutes for folks to type. Okay, so we're not seeing any open questions. What looks like we'll maybe we'll give it maybe one more minute. So if you do have a question, feel free to type it into the Q and A. Okay, I do see a question here. Misty, I'm just going to read through your question here before I say it out loud. Okay, yeah, Misty, I think that, that, um, that I'll follow up with you on that question. Um, that's a, a pretty specific question, so I'll follow up with you on that after, after the webinar.
Okay, we do have, I'm not. Oh, sorry. We go do ahead. Have, no, no problem. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Kim. Okay. Um, it says, is it solely our responsibility to provide PPE? Is the first question. Um, so if you have employees who are coming, so uh, Kim, I let's see, I, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that you're uh, talking about your employees who are in the shop. So um, I would say that I would highly recommend having employees, uh, providing employees with PPE um, I, on the resource page um, and in, a, in the Bellevue Chamber webinar uh, that, that they gave a couple of weeks ago, um, they did provide a link to information uh, to, to a website called Bess International, um, and I can send you that link um, that that is a, a website that uh, is, a, I believe, a local company that is providing um, priority shipping of PPE. So, you know, medical grade masks, for instance, um, not N95 masks, of course, but um, they, they are providing some PPE um, that you can purchase um, and have priority shipping for Washington businesses. So that's an option. Um, if you... Uh, you know, I, I, if you're getting to a question of whether you can, you know, ask your employees to provide their own masks, then, um, you know, if they if they want to wear their own mask, I say I would say that would be fine. Um, and I would just say be prepared if an employee um, doesn't have their own mask to make sure that they are wearing one. And if the desks are over six feet apart, do staff members need to wear masks? Um, so that's a good question. I think, you know, to the extent that employees are interacting, so, you know, if they're sitting at their desks and they're 20 feet apart from each other, I would say probably safe to not wear masks, um, provided that there's appropriate ventilation in the room. Um, you know, they, uh, OSHA has also recommended that you have, you know, a good ventilation and, and air movement throughout the room so that um, you don't have, um, you know, virus um, potentially, you know, in the air. Uh, so if you have employees who are, you know, far apart and they're not really interacting, that's fine. Um, if, for instance, they would be walking past each other in a hallway, then that's something you're going to need to consider. Um, so, so, yeah, there's things to think about. Um, it does, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> so, you know, if, if, there's, uh, if there's scenarios where, um, where you know, it, it is maintaining all the social distancing requirements, then, then I would say that's probably okay. Um, and, it, you know, we're just going to make our best, best judgments here um, on, on some of these um, more challenging questions like that. Okay. All right. So I'm not seeing any more questions. Give it maybe one more minute, um, but otherwise folks can feel free to sign off. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you today. Um, we will send uh, the slides out to you via email and um, we'll be posting this webinar up on our YouTube channel. So you'll get the link to that. Uh, if you do have any more questions, of course, feel free to reach out to me via email. It's just ashley at equinoxbusinesslaw.com um, or contact at equinoxbusinesslaw.com. You can reach us through our website. Um, so it's been a pleasure being with you guys today and um, stay safe and best of luck.